So what uh, Zach and I are going to talk today is about uh, the identity-based segmentation for a zero trust architecture. So naturally, so we have to give some uh, leading information on what is the zero trust architecture and why zero trust. And then we delve into what is identity-based segmentation. And then uh, all the nuances of the policy checks uh, Zach will explain exactly. later. So, uh, Do you want to introduce yourself, actually, to the... Yeah, my name is uh, uh, Chandra Mouli. People call me as Mouli for short. I work for uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, like in Gettysburg, Washington, D.C. area. So, yeah. so we have been working with... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, Mouli is responsible for writing a lot of the SPs that, that y'all need to go implement uh, in practice. <laughs> <laughs> so his fault, but also awesome work. <laughs> Uh, and I'm Zach, I'm one of the founding engineers at TouchRate, and uh, I work very closely with Muli to help author some of these. Uh, in particular, we've written a lot of the SP800-204 series together, which is the set of security recommendations for microservices and multi-cloud. Uh, however, we're actually going to be working on, together on some things around Zero Trust very soon, and you'll get a nice sneak peek of that here in this presentation. So, first of all, uh as uh, Zach mentioned in the uh, keynote address, Zero Trust has been uh, around for quite some time. Uh, but then why is a sudden uh, fo focus on Zero Trust right now? Is of course we know all the good reasons uh, that uh, no longer there is something called a perimeter exists uh, because people are sitting all over the place. And secondly, the applications themselves have become quite distributed. So naturally, east-west traffic is now a bigger part of the traffic rather than north-south traffic. And uh, uh, secondly, uh, all applications are in the form of uh, you know, microservices. There are many pieces involved. And uh, so naturally, uh, the, each of the access uh, decisions should be based upon uh, per request um, and uh, take into account all the contextual variables because there are very many variables involved. And it should be, of course, uh, conformed to the uh, good old uh, cardinal principles of least privilege, and so on and so forth. And naturally, uh, it should be, uh, so naturally means it is, should be identity-based. So and uh, who are all the entities carrying identity? You know, the users and uh, services and devices. Yeah. So that's what we are going to focus on today about the identity-based yeah. segmentation. And again, the high-level framing is, you know, assume the attacker's in the network. What do we do to mitigate the damage that they can do by binding their attack in space and in time. Yep. So uh, then, uh, so th we have now actually uh, shown the need for why a focus on zero trust now, an identity-based uh, segmentation. So in other words, uh, why do we call it as identity-based segmentation? Because originally our controls were based upon the assumption of a, uh, a perimeter. And now that uh, we venture into the zero trust, the initial thinking was, uh, can we do a segmentation of the network itself? Uh, so, but the existing techniques on uh, network segmentation, like, you know, based upon subnets, as well as some labels, as we case, the case of VLAN, are no longer sufficient. Because all the virtualized containerized workloads, they move all over the place. You can't pin them to a particular, uh, even a network address or a subnet and so on. So that's why we need an identity-based uh, architecture. So in the zero trust architecture, essentially what we really describe is all the very components that are involved and uh, all the data flows that are involved. And uh, last but not the least, the, all the policies that we require and then uh, the security of the enforcement points. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that we want to concentrate as far as the zero trust architecture is concerned. And then uh, this zero set architecture is the fundamentally it is based upon uh, the identity based uh, uh, segmentation. So it's another name for uh, zero trust uh, segmentation also. Um, and then, of course, uh, as we all know, identity based means what the name implies. You know, it is uh, uh, not based upon any network uh, parameters and it applies to uh, services, users, and devices. And also, uh, it should be uh, not just any identity arbitrarily like user ID and so on. It should be a um, cryptographically verifiable identity. That's, uh, that's uh, 
That's yeah. the most important thing as far as the service is concerned. Yeah, and a couple of things here to note is, you know, that and in that second bullet point is doing a lot of heavy lifting there, right? So we need not just a service and a user identity, but we also want to know where, you know, the device that it's originating from. And, you know, we may even use things like the network parameters as part of a risk-based assessment to give you permission or scope or things like that. But it cannot be the only check that you're doing because that is not sufficient. We need the identity checks, and we can continue to apply traditional checks like network location as part of a layered defense. And we'll talk about that layering very soon here. So, actually then, uh, as far as the zero trust is concerned, the comprehensive solutions we know consist of not only uh, runtime checks, but also the whole process is in place, and also the monitoring and uh, continuous uh, um, reformulations of policies and so on. So that is the whole process. But in this uh, presentation, we are just focusing on the identity-based uh, segmentation aspects alone. Yeah, so really just the runtime controls, the run which to be honest are the easy part. The, the people process things are gonna be the hard part to change within the organization. But the runtime controls we can help solve with technology, right? And, and it right. Be, can become a lot simpler. So it is a runtime technology solutions that we are focusing on this. And then uh, we identified, at least in the concept of uh, uh, microservices environment to service mesh that uh, we do need at the minimum these five things. First, uh, the, the session itself should be secure. For that, uh, we need encryption in transit. And then, of course, uh, we do need to validate uh, service identities. And then once identity is validated, we need uh, some means of authorizing authorization at uh, the service level. And then, of course, uh, uh, the end user is also an integral part of the whole picture. We need to have an authentication of the end user, and then uh, lastly, the end user authorization as well. End user authorization, especially if you want uh, um, resource level controls, you need to have uh, end user authorization as well. Exactly. So, and that this is our goal of realizing the ZTA through this five yeah. um, technology approaches. Yeah, and just to you know, kind of paint a picture here, you, know, you can imagine moving up the tiers. We, we go from subnet-based connectivity and, and micro-segmentation at that level. We can start to layer in identity-based controls, but policy gets really powerful and very compelling when I can combine both service runtime policy and user access policy together, right? So you can write a policy that says, for example, not just the front end can call the back end, but the front end can call a particular method on the back end only in the presence of a valid end user credential that has the permission to read, for example, right? And so again, the game is all about bounding an attack in space and in time. Those more comprehensive policies that combine both physical location and, and application as well as end user credential do a lot to help us write very tight policy that bounds an attacker in space, the, the, what they can pivot to attack very tightly. Yeah, so as a, just a background to that, we want to uh, have some uh, overall view of service mesh. Uh, we know that we are somewhat preaching to the choir. Everyone will be familiar with the service mesh, but uh, just to give you an idea that the service mesh really is meant to accomplish uh, three primary things. So one, it has, has the infrastructure, as an infrastructure layer, uh, it provides the identity to the applications, which is the very key. And then the second one is, it does all the things with uh, the traffic routing, starting from uh, service discovery, uh, intelligent uh, routing, and all the nice and goody resilient measures, like the number of uh, retries, blue-green deployments, and all mm -hmm. that stuff. And then the third one is, of course, the most important, is to enforce the uh, service to service uh, authorization as well as end user to resource authorization. So those that's where all our focus on policies and everything comes into the picture. So, and uh, not only because uh, uh, this beautiful entity called uh, the proxy that uh, is part of the data plane of the service mesh that uh, actually really acts as a security kernel because it is uh, non-bypassable uh, and uh, also it's verifiable. It is outside the application code. Correct. And then, uh, so then, uh, actually, we just uh, give a brief uh, description of how. Uh, Oops, sorry. So sorry. <laughs> uh, these uh, various things are accomplished in uh, this one. So, as uh, also most of you may be familiar, 
the encryption we ensures through the mutual uh, TLS and shake uh, usually the using the service identity which contains the uh, service identity is the subject alternate name field of the ser uh, service, the short lived yeah. service. Yeah, basically we can leverage spiffy certs to do both encryption and transit as well as our, authentic our authenticatable runtime service identity. Yeah. So we use the same uh, certificate for service identity and uh, authentication as well. And then for uh, service to service uh, authorization, uh, we actually got a lot of umpteen options using that. It can be an uh, you know in process uh, uh, filters in the proxy itself, or and you can use the proxy extensions, or you can call external services if you want more sophisticated authentication, like you know the NGAC that NIST has developed and so on. And uh, similar, then we come to the end user uh, identity authentication. There, uh, as we have said in one of our publications, that uh, the, we can uh, land up with. Uh, you can use any of your uh, native identity providers to give you the end user authentication, <laughs> the end user credentials. And then uh, at the ingress point in the gate, on the ingress gateway, you can exchange it for uh, uh, a JAR token, uh, you know, which contains, uh, you will give the uh, local identity and so on. And it can also populate it uh, with claims. Mm -hmm. And then the same uh, in the end user when they are inside uh, the mesh and making a call. So those, uh, uh, the claims in the JAR token can be used and compared against the resources that are being requested in that particular resource. Or again, here we have the option that if you want to detail resource level authorization, we go to an external service like uh, NJAC and so on for end user to resource authentication. And you know, specifically in uh, SB 800-204-B, which uh, Muli and I wrote, we talk about extra, and so if you want to dig into the, some of these ideas in more detail, go check that out. We talk about pulling out things like authentication into this common layer, into the service mesh, so that it can be you know, audited, so that we can have higher assurance in the code because it's not delegated across every application. Um, you know, there's a lot of really strong properties from a security perspective that we can get pushing this out into a common layer, right? As long as the application still ensures that those checks have been applied when it gets it. Things like, you know, looking at a JOT that the system mints, validating that JOT that it came from a trusted source, and then using those claims to actually apply authorization is one way that, you know, a, an application can attest that these checks have happened before the, the uh, request reaches it. Yeah, essentially we have detailed uh, the function of how the uh, token is being processed to yeah. arrive at. Uh, yeah, uh, and and not just jots; it doesn't have to be. And you know, one thing I'll just point out is, you know, there are actually multiple, you know, high uh, assurance deployments, uh, you know, hitting things like FedRAMP moderate and high controls, leveraging things like the service mesh to offload uh, user authentication and authorization to the to a common infra layer to the mesh. Right, and so this is not just you know something that we can do, but this is something that actually is done in the wild in high criticality environments that are security first. Right. So far, we have outlined all the goodies that a service mesh can do, but then this may be at a particular service mesh instance for a particular cluster and so on. So how do you take it to the enterprise level? And that's where we need another infrastructure layer that's sitting on top of the individual service meshes so that you can uh, apply uniform policies uh, throughout the enterprise for all the service meshes and so on. And secondly, that is really uh, a reality because not only there are multiple clusters within the organization, but the common uh, scenario is that you do have hybrid environments, you do have some resources uh, in-house in the data centers and branch offices and some in clouds and some in even multiple clouds. Mm -hmm. So when that is the scenario there, we definitely need a, a higher level infrastructure layer to in fact uh, act as the super control plane for these individual control planes in the service mesh instances. Exactly, and that lets us do things like enforce consistent identity for services across the different sites. That lets us do things like author a single policy, hey, the front end can call the back end, and manifest that policy across the infrastructure, right? And we can take care to ensure that we have the right application end identities everywhere, even when we're doing things like going across clusters or across clouds. So that same policy that you write, front end kick all back end, 
is going to apply equally, regardless of whether they live next to each other on the same, you know, pods on the same host, or they happen to be, you know, traversing a DMZ and going through a firewall to reach back to the data center. So yeah, that's why. So you do need definitely everyone is convinced about the NAP to app policies, but then these policies alone cannot be sufficient. So that is why we need uh, policies at the multiple tiers. Why? Uh, because uh, the network level policies are needed because uh, uh, some of the compliance regulations and even regulators, uh, they are not satisfied with anything else. Yeah. Other because service identity is something not everybody can get, get their hands on and things like that. And uh, secondly, it does serve its purpose in the sense that uh, uh, the, the network level policies itself can be at uh, two tiers. One is very coarse grain, you know, between uh, firewall to firewall. But it can also be uh, somewhat uh, uh, subnet based in the sense of uh, uh, from a gateway to gateway and so on. And then, of course, on top of it, uh, as Zach said, we can layer all the uh, goody service identity based policies on top of these network policies. And uh, so the beauty of this is we can, this policies can really coexist in the sense they don't have to conflict with each other. So the multi-tier policy is the most uh, uh, desirable thing. And, uh, and as uh, just now described, can be the network tier policies, uh, which is can be go both coarse grained and fine grained, and then the identity tier, tier policies, which are more really uh, dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why, so the network tier policies can be really be uh, static, so you don't have to really, in some sense it is allows for relaxation of those policies in favor of higher level policies. Exactly. So we keep changing with the environment and yeah. so on and so forth. And really this is, before uh, before we hop on, you know, this is really all about kind trying to pave a path for organizations and the auditors who check the organization's compliance to understand the move from a perimeter model into an identity-based model. And so we view these multi-tiered policies, one, as a stepping stone to facilitate that, but two, exactly like Mully said, as a, is to help with defense in depth, more layers for an attacker to have to traverse, you know, more ways to bound the attack in both space and in time. Right, and then this is uh, just a schematic diagram that's just showing at, uh, yeah. between what entities uh, the uh, network policies apply and then where uh, Application layer. Exactly. And so just to help kind of make some of these ideas concrete and help kind of paint the picture for how they might help you bridge a traditional perimeter model, I want to, you know, walk through some cases. So, you know, suppose we have these two services communicating. And suppose one, you know, they're at either different sites or maybe one is in cloud, one is in the data center, right? And so we have a traditional, you know, DMZ and a whole class of policy that we want to apply to that traffic as it's coming into kind of our trusted data center. Oftentimes, that requires rule changes per app, right? And that is where we get the pain in managing uh, outbound firewalls. This is where we get the pain in managing the network-oriented rules, right? You look at a set of subnets that are allowed to, to egress to a set of IP addresses, and like, what does it mean, <laughs> right? And this is where we have a spreadsheet where, it, where we record it somewhere, right? That is, is clearly brittle and painful, and r we see it regularly create you know, slowdowns in organizations, right? So one of the ideas that we put forward is using basically identity aware gateways to help us bridge that perimeter. So the idea is that we can have you know, uh, gateways on both sides of the, of the perimeter. We can establish relatively static policies to facilitate those gateways communicating and we don't need to change those policies per app because those gateways are, are static deployments on our site. Then we can leverage identity-based policy, which, is, which can be much more dynamic and hopefully easier to maintain, about who can go over that connection, who can go over that transit. So in other words, uh, as Zach explained, these uh, gateways offer a somewhat of a bridge to go from uh, identity-based policies to the network-based policies in the sense that they are participating in both. Exactly. And, uh, so, so in that sense, they are able to uh, go for policies. And now, uh, yeah, so we will uh, explain in detail yeah. these three levels of policies, coarse grain, yeah, network, fine-grain network, and then the identity-based ones. Yeah, exactly. And so we see these exactly overlay on top of each other, right? And so we have exactly like Molly said, coarse grain firewall policy at the bottom. Obviously, these are not like you know real-world policies, but a shorthand for you to kind of get the idea, right? 
we have firewall to firewall policy. We need micro segmentation as well on each half. Very hard to manage how they go over that, <laughs> by the way. Uh, with things like a CNI, it becomes challenging. It's not easy to bridge across the two halves of our policy. The service mesh can sit on top of that and, and facilitate consistent policy across our different deployments, right? So we know, you know, lower level policy is gonna live at the site, right? The, the micro segmentation is bound to a cluster usually, right, or, or a set of VPCs. Uh, and we typically don't, you know, we, we're gonna open up firewall rules between the two. We typically don't see micro segmentation across uh, these. That's again where we can start to layer, we can start to relax some of those policies that can be hard to maintain and replace them or augment them with mesh level, identity level policies that can be consistent across the entire infrastructure. And when I say consistent across the entire infrastructure, what I mean is like literally we can instantiate the same policy document in every mesh without having to specialize it or change it for each deployment and have it be correctly enforced because identities flow in the end. Um, so as we're looking at how we realize this, this enterprise ETA, you know, the first step is we want to start to implement this identity-based segmentation, right? We want to start to migrate towards identity-based policy and we can leverage some of these patterns to help make our lives easier dealing with things like the traditional perimeter. Uh, you know, as we said, uh, um, you know, we need some, you will likely want some central coordination infrastructure that sits above a service mesh to help manage some of these, right? So if we look at a traditional, uh, you know, corporate topology of, of three zones, uh, this is pretty standard stuff that we see all the time. We can start to insert these identity aware policy enforcement points, these gateways, fundamentally an envoy proxy in the data path there to start to leverage higher level policy at all of these locations. So in other words, uh, what we call as uh, proxies in the context of service mesh, they play the role of uh, the ingress proxy as well as the egress proxy, and then also uh, as what is known as the transit proxies itself. Yeah. Now in terms of uh, they can even perform other goodies like load distributions and, and identifying the ingress proxy for the various uh, clusters and so on. Yeah, so exactly. Because there's a certain amount of like service discovery information you'll need to propagate across clusters, right? Uh, for example, you know, your ingress edge may want to load balance across multiple clusters behind it in, in the same VPC or in the same data center. So there's some service discovery that you need to, to wire up. There's policy that we want to push to these layers as well. You know, and so we can start to leverage things like your CD pipeline as one of the ways to implement this coordination infrastructure. Right, you can, for example, templatize a lot of the things like service exposure and service consumption and let your CD pipeline instantiate the policies across the various meshes. Uh, certainly there are online ways to do that as well. So the advantage of implementing all this through the proxies is you, know, you can have a level of security assurance Exactly. Because of all this, yeah. yeah. And fundamentally, again, you know, we see this as layering on top of each other. So again, this is a, you know, kind of a rough picture, but, you know, we still anticipate these traditional uh, perimeter-based controls. We're going to have, you know, segmentation or micro-segmentation uh, underneath that, inside of that perimeter, right? Uh, you, typically, CNI will sit even on top of that as another layer. And we want the mesh to fit exactly on top of all those, right? And again, the advantage here is that we can start to relax some of these lower level policies that are hard to maintain in favor of policies allowing these gateways to communicate and back that with identity-based policy to instead. Yeah, so again, you know, why do we do this? The main motivation for, you know, in, in general, uh, Identity-based segmentation, hopefully people get why we would want to do this in the context of moving towards a ZTA. Why might we want to manage multiple tiers of policy at the same time while we're doing that? You know, again, it's really all about appeasing your current regulatory requirements, your current control requirements, and the knowledge of your current security team and the auditors, regulators you have to deal with, right? They may not be in some places you know, they're very forward. For example, the Air Force is a very forward organization where I can, I don't need a perimeter and I don't need to, to show a bunch of these controls to get approval, to get an ATO, 
other parts are not the same, right? And, sorry, yeah. and so we want that defense in depth to be able to prove both the original perimeter-based controls and that we can do better and that we can facilitate the organization moving faster because we're not having to manage brittle policy at a lower layer. And further, uh, most of the time, the reluctance in, acceptance, in accepting the policies is due to the complexity. And that way, uh, in the tail case of identity-based policies, we are able to express it in terms of entities that people can understand. Exactly. This application and this uh, process can talk to this application and this process. Exactly. So that's one of the other advantages. Yeah, policy Identity becomes a lot more, yeah, policy is more maintainable because it's more readable and it's in terms that are closer to what a developer thinks about service names and service identities, not like what subnet am I on? And again, these can continue to exist uh, and, and we expect them to. Um, we'll end and, and take questions for, for whatever time we have left, but just to, to give you a teaser here, uh, SB 800-207-A will be coming out in this calendar year in 2023 uh, around these ideas, this idea of starting to use identity-based uh, policy enforcement points to help span traditional perimeter-based uh, uh, controls. Uh, and with that, I think we have hopefully a little bit of time left for, for some questions, I think maybe about five or seven minutes. Uh, so please, any, any questions for, for either of us, for both of us? Yeah, exactly, yeah, and so we, and you know, for example, NGAC, Next Generation Access Control, is an access control standard uh, that NIST is working on that's an ABAC, kind of similar conceptually to what Zanzibar is used to implement. Uh, and so, yeah, exactly, you know, we can implement, you know, all of these orange pieces are policy enforcement points, and we can choose whether we integrate with an external system to apply, you know, potentially very rich policy because we have like an, a full ABAC, like a Zanzibar kind of a system. Um, but we can also apply much simpler policies that are like already built into Envoy, right? For example, you know, just simple service to service uh, access with RBAC, right? And so that's a spectrum there. So yeah, the, the mesh is bringing enforcement and what you choose to use as your decision system, you know, as long as it integrates with the mesh, it's, it's all good, right? And we typically see, for example, OPA used with Envoy actually enforcing the policy, but OPA acting as the decision point, right, is, is a very common deployment. And uh, all that is possible because of uh, these capabilities of proxy one, it can do the enforcement doing, using an in-process program, like a dot filter, which compares simply the, uh, the resources against the claims and so on. Or you can use uh, external APIs or you know you can call a regular authorization service with yeah. the external. So all this because of the extensible APA of the proxies, all these goodies are possible. Yeah. Decoupling the authentication from the authorization decision point, so we're no longer you know relying on access services to do it all mm -hmm. by creating categories and stuff. Right. That's the goal to get to. You can certainly start by delegating to Active Directory because that encodes your current policy, right? And so we don't, you know, I don't want to paint this as a picture of like, do this perfectly. The whole goal is to give us stepping stones to get to kind of that ideal world where we're doing very rich end user based application context aware policy on every hop. That's the goal to get to. If the policy is in Active Directory today and we can use that to do user to, uh, authorization, then that's the perfect place to start with one of the integrations and then go from there into a richer policy engine where you need it. So in other words, it offers a very graded path no, rather than one day turning out the light and so on. Exactly. Let's have another question here. Yeah, so it can be any number of things. 
Yeah, it can be, you know, there, uh, yeah, typically it's going to be like a CD system that's coordinating. There's also a variety of like vendor products that do online policy pushing and like multi cluster management and stuff like that as well. And, you know, any of those are good ways to do it. The, you know, in my opinion, the important thing is to get the right abstractions for your application developers and fit them into your workflow, their workflow, in, a, in the right way. And then it shouldn't really matter if it's the CD system that does it or some other engine because they should be interacting with it in a way that's abstracted and controlled by the platform team. Uh, that's why we want to call it as a super control plane that yeah. sits on top of the individual service mesh instance control plane. Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily, so control plane applies runtime. It doesn't necessarily have to be a runtime system. It can be a system like a CD system that's pushing it, but it can also be a runtime online system that's acting as a control plane, getting data and pushing it around. Uh, both of those are good ways. It depends on what you need out of the system and what are the properties uh, and what's the operational investment you want to make for what is right. Uh, Arjun. Um, so early on, you had a requirement for cryptographic authentication yes. of identity. Yes. Uh, but now you've talked a lot about delegating out those control tests to external programs. 100%. Uh, it seems like a nonce that's stored externally in those programs that's just random garbage would work equally well to a cryptographic identifier. Uh, it could potentially, okay. right? So like, yeah, um, you know, it doesn't really matter how we encode that identity as long as we all agree on what the identities mean and we have some mechanism at runtime to authenticate it, right? So at a service, you know, at a service to service layer, of course we want to leverage Spiffy because that's a good standard. But you know, at the end user layer, it could be you know, whatever you want, right? It doesn't really matter. Um, and, and you know, the SP, for example, won't be strongly opinionated on that. Right. Yeah, that's why you said you can have either a custom authentication or one of the OIDC providers OpenID connect. Yeah, because so, we, we very frequently see, you know, yeah, somebody do OIDC. Options, yeah, OIDC or OAuth, and they're just holding tokens, right? right. And so it, it might as well just be an opaque thing. If you wanted to do macros or something like that as well. Exactly, <laughs> right. So there's plenty of room to do, exactly. Yeah, do a SIG way you can come up with a simpler OAuth, better token. And yeah, things. exactly. And to be clear, you know, encryption in transit, We just to tee off that a little bit, why do we say encryption in transit is required? It's not because encryption in transit is good. It's because we want message authenticity and we want eavesdropping protection, right? And so we can achieve the, like, mess and message authenticity is the really important one, right? You may or may not care about eavesdroppers, uh, being able to see what the requests are, but you certainly want to know that it hasn't been tampered with because otherwise all these other checks are meaningless. Right? Who cares what the identity is if the mess if somebody stuffed the envelope with something different, right? Um, and so it really has to start there with the assurance of the data on the wire, and then we can use that to, to kick off policy down. All right, any other questions? Yeah. Nope. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the question is, is roughly just to paraphrase, you know, can have auditors actually approve this? Can I, can I actually do this pattern? Is that roughly it? Yeah. Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, across the board, we've seen a bunch of different auditors under different regulatory regimes approve these style things. Whether that's folks like the Air Force uh, AOs who have, who have approved ATO for a lot of, uh, you know, federal moderate to, to high systems on this kind of thing. We also see it in folks that are subject to PCI. Right, and, and for years, actually, we've seen folks implement a variety of PCI controls using uh, this kind of stuff, right? Uh, so this is something that we're seeing, and that's why we're moving to start to write this as a standard, right? Not because it's, it's brand new and like we think it's a cool idea, but we've seen this implemented, we're seeing regulators start to accept it. And so our goal in codifying it as an SP is to really push that to those regulators, to those approvers, to say this is a good thing, you should accept this as a first step for educating them to move the ball to get to the end state that we all want, which is like identity-based policy. <laughs>
in other words the lessons learned there in to the impl implementation that Zach talked about as really uh, is going to be a good uh, input into this document that we are yeah uh, was there a follow up there yeah Yeah, so we're starting to build those out. So for example, there is an Istio to uh, NIST SB853 mapping, uh, for example, and that's actually in the form of an OSCAL manifest that can be used to, to uh, feed that in and, and check the assurance of the system at runtime, right? Uh, so that's, it's early days for that, but those are things that are being developed there. Uh, and the goal is to push a lot of this into open source, right? So things like OSCAL, the open source compliance assessment language, lets us do programmatic uh, checks a computer can verify that you're implementing controls, not a human auditor who's squinting at it and checks the box, right? That moves us to a world where we can do it continuously. My goal is that we can get basically all the, the big infrastructure projects that we're depending on to produce and maintain OSCAL definitions uh, of their components. That's the, you know, that's one of my longer term goals to, to try and implement. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the important part here is not how the policy enforcement is implemented, right? So I mentioned Envoy a few times here, but you know, all the concepts that we're talking about are independent of the data plane implementation. Right, so as long as you're doing those five checks, I don't care, you know, you shouldn't care, nobody really needs to care if it's eBPF or if it's Envoy or, or if it's some or a VPN, like, a, you, you know, it's not, that part is not very important, right? There will be security and runtime and operational trade-offs to different implementations, and we are starting to do some write-ups, kind of starting to analyze that, right? Uh, I fully expect a lot of this policy to move into eBPF as an accelerator. Right, anything that we can move out of user space and into the kernel to be able to reject a request earlier without having to do those context switches is gonna pay a lot of dividends for, for you know, higher throughput and higher performance systems, right? And so in that sense, we, I expect that eBPF will be widely used as an accelerator for data plane policy application, right? So in other words, providing coverage for the various events is what is important to us rather than what will help us identify the <laughs> events. Oh, yeah. in terms of the kernel trigger or something. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Already, are we, do we have time for more? Or what are, how are we doing on time? I'm not, nobody's come with the crook to get me off the stage yet, so we can keep doing questions until, until that happens. Uh, any other uh, questions from, from folks? General question. Yeah. Yes, they uh, yes they will be available. The conference should make them available. Uh, if not, um, I think we have our contact info here. You know, just shoot an email. Worst case, uh, if they don't they don't pop up in a week. Alrighty, awesome. Well, hey, y'all have been an awesome audience. I really appreciate the good questions. Uh, thank you. Thanks for your time.